All right, welcome, welcome to the Ujima Hour. Welcome to the Ujima Hour. I am Michael Tekin Strode, broadcasting to you live from home. Um, yes, uh, this is uh, Michael Tekin Strode on the Ujima Hour. Uh, and I should turn off that VPN <laughs> because otherwise, you know, the stream quality is going to be reduced. Um, yes, so um, welcome, welcome. Um, Michael Tekin Strode with the Ujima Hour. Uh, here, I'm broadcasting live to you from uh, wherever my home is. Um, it's in Chicago. It's somewhere in the southeast. Uh, so I really thank you for being here this evening. Um, this is, uh, you know, there, there's a lot that's happening. It's an interesting time. It is always an interesting time. Um, and certainly, you know, we are nearing to election season, um, you know, in the States. So it will only get more interesting as things go. Um, I am here um, on the Ujima Awa because uh, we do every month on the second Monday of the month um, this uh, intimate and informal exploration of the black social solidarity economy. Um, we will get into what all of that means, uh, but effectively it's really just, you know, how are black people doing cooperative economics? Um, how are people, how are black people imagining the future uh, of economics um, through their organizing, through the work that they are doing? Uh, and, and what are some of the, the ways that we can actually engage in projects um, that are seeking to uh, advance that vision of an economic future? Um, you know, what are some ways that we can tap into based upon some of the things that people are actually doing, some, some of the work that people are doing in their communities? Um, so on the Ujima Awa, we have been covering um, since 2018, um, you know, folks who are technical assistants, uh, uh, you know, um, folks, uh, folks who are doing uh, organizing, folks who are doing activism, uh, you know, folks who are doing gardening, you know, there's this, all this, this multitude of different things that people are doing in their communities uh, to make change, to affect change, um, to create the future that we deserve, that we desire. Uh, and those are things that we want to talk to people about. Those are things that we want to dig into. Um, and I hope that, you know, these 28 segments and 23 interviews have been uh, of some value, of some use, uh, because ultimately, you know, um, what we are doing here is is for naught if we are not able to take some of the lessons that we are drawing from the, the, the work that folks are doing and bring it back to the communities where we are working um, and, and make change where we are. Uh, so uh, tonight we've got a, a very special guest this evening that we'll be introducing a bit later, um, Eric Jackson from Black Yield Institute. Uh, so I really look forward to bringing uh, that, that, uh, that guest segment to you. Um, and so, you know, before we do that, um, of course we have to introduce uh, this you know, space that we are in. Uh, I am Michael Tekken Strode and down in the bottom right corner there, um, you do see the logo of the Colonut Collaborative, you know, and I can't point because, you know, I mean, I'm looking uh, inversely at the camera, but you do see the logo of the Colonut Collaborative. The Colonut Collaborative is Chicago's uh, only um, service, um, time-based service and skills exchange, um, otherwise known as a time bank. A time bank is simply a space, it's simply an infrastructure where people are able to um, pitch the things that they, they would like to offer to the community. Um, and, and post the things that they need from the community. And ultimately, you know, we're hoping that inside of an infrastructure like a time bank, people can begin to do some of that social matchmaking to connect the offers and the needs um, so that ultimately um, we can begin to think about the resource base in the community uh, uh, differently, right? You know, ultimately, you know, even if you don't have uh, money in a community, you do have lots of skills, you have uh, intellectual capacities, you have uh, cultural capacities, you have you know, all, all types of skills and, and, and resources that might be available if we begin to think a little bit more broadly beyond um, the dollars and cents that we exchange with one another. So uh, that's what the Colonet Collaborative does, and that is how we arrive at a space called the Ujima Hour. Um, Ujima, uh, of course, in Swahili, meaning cooperative economics in one sense, uh, but in another sense, um, familyhood. And so if you go back and revisit um, our December 2018 episode with uh, Dr. Kamal Rashid, um, he talks about this notion of familyhood, and we discussed um, this notion of Ujima um, in the context of Julius Nyerere and, uh, and, and Tanzania, post-colonial Tanzania. And what, um, the, what Julius Nyerere developed inside of Tanzania was this idea of um, 
of Ujamaa um, as a sort of African social system, right? You know, the, a sort of, you know, and, and in fact, very, very directly calling it African socialism. And, um, you know, but this notion that, you know, we can think about, um, you know, um, nation building and nationhood um, in a way that really values the sort of social ownership of, of the, the things that are produced, you know, how things, um, how things are shared amongst society. Um, and so, you know, the, those are some things that we are always reflecting on when we're going through the Ujamaa, where we're thinking about what it looks like to have that social ownership, to have that shared ownership. Um, and we're thinking about what, what is the value of that? What is the, what is the utility and what is the necessity of that um, in this current moment that we're in? Um, so one of the things we're doing in uh, the Cooperation for Liberation Study and Working Group right now is uh, you, um, when, we, when we talked last time, we were getting ready to engage the Ella Baker text um, uh, by Dr. Uh, Barbara Ransby. Um, we switched directions. And why did we switch directions? Um, there was some discussion within the, the the core team and within amongst some of the membership that hey we we probably did not go through the full consensus discussion in order to get to the text that we arrived at so we went back and we we reworked our census uh, process and voted on a new text and and then when we voted um the text that came to the top was freedom farmers agricultural resistance in the black freedom movement by dr monica m white um and that process is actually as important as the text itself, right? Um, the text itself is tremendously valuable and important. Never let me diminish anything about what, uh, what um, Monica White has done here in this text. But the process was really about us coming to an agreement that um, about what our collective study was going to be over the next you know, several months. Um, you know, usually we'll probably get through this text you know, maybe in about, um, maybe, you know, six months, five, five months or something like that, just based upon, you know, our bi-weekly meeting schedule and some of the discussions that we have around the text. So um, we, we've shifted over to Freedom Farmers. Um, so you can catch us again, um, you know, in November um, because we are currently on break. Um, so yeah, so so we, we meet on alternating Sundays um, at 3 p.m. Um, and, you know, what we what we will be doing is we will be uh, doing what we have always done with these texts. We 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 dig in, and that is November first. There we go, November first, uh, three p.m. Uh, to six p.m. So I'll talk about that at the end of the broadcast. But what we do on that uh, on, on those alternating Sundays is we sit down with the text. We really dig in, and we begin to. Um, think about how these elements in this text relate to the development of a worker cooperative. Um, we, we draw lessons, we, 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 dig in, we dig through the history, we build collages, you know, to, to kind of, um, you know, really embody the history that's in these texts. Because ultimately, again, you know, what we're doing in Cooperation for Liberation is we're, we're studying the history of cooperatives because we are trying to chart the future of cooperatives in the work that we're doing. Um, so, you know, more, more to come at the end of the broadcast. I'll, I'll tell you how to plug into that further. Um, but we are digging into Freedom Farmers, and you know, I certainly would uh, encourage you to pick up a copy. Um, one of the other things that has happened um, in the uh, in the in the period between la, when I was last broadcasting and now is the passing of Alandria Williams. Um, you know, and and it's. The difficulty there is um, you never know how things are going to affect you. Um, you know, truthfully, Elandria and I knew one another in passing. You know, um, we had met, you know, um, face to face at the, the New Economy Coalition annual member meeting in Asheville, um, you know, maybe a, a summer ago, right? Um, and then we had our first um, long conversation of about an hour. Um, the week before their passing, right? Um, and so I was very prepared after that conversation that like I was determined that I needed to interview Elandria on the Ujima Hour. I needed to get that interview on tape. I needed to archive that voice, right? And it's, it's not like there's not a fair amount of tape already out there for Elandria, but you know, there was more to tell. Um, there is more to tell. And so, you know, I, and, and, and the, the, the depth of how this impacts me is, um, you know, I, I 
I talked about you know the passing of another friend of Kwak for Lib um, in the, earlier in the year, um, Davine Stewart, you know, who who um, had also in, engaged with Kwak for Lib in the space, and again, you know, it's it's someone um, that you meet and you meet them for a, a brief window of time and you don't get to appreciate their genius and you're, you're sort of mourning for the opportunity to really dig into and understand the depth of that genius. So, um, you know, I give it up um, for Elandria Williams. Um, I encourage you to um, go ahead and dig into that Elandria taught us hashtag um, and just really, you know, um, mine some of the wisdom um, that, that uh, E has left behind. Um, and that is still present with us. Um, and, and make sure, definitely, when the Beautiful Solutions text comes out, make sure you get that. Um, that's gonna be a very important one. So really get into that Beautiful Solutions text, get into that Mapping Our Futures curriculum on the Highlander website, and you know that Alandria taught us hashtag. Dig into all three of those uh, resources, please. Um, one other thing that's um, happened here locally in Chicago is that um, <coughs> WBZ reported on hundreds of affordable <coughs> voice, um, hundreds of affordable uh, affordable housing units are going up for sale on the south side of Chicago at an auction, um, and there being two private equity firms um, or two you know real estate firms that effectively bought up you know uh, those properties, and you know one of the things that I was reflecting on as that that uh, situation occurred and as people were reflecting and, and just kind of sharing their thoughts on. Um, on Facebook, you know, um, there's folks kind of throwing out action alerts and, you know, and just trying to figure out, you know, what can we do? How can we, you know, challenge the sale? How can we stop the sale? Who do we need to kind of talk to? Um, one of the things that occurred to me was um, uh, about the Moms for Housing um, uh, fight in Oakland and then also recently the the, the Philly, um, Philadelphia tent city fight, right? Um, in both of those instances, um, at the end, there was a, a period of resistance where people were saying like you know you are not serving us so we're gonna make we're gonna make the noise we're gonna we're gonna be in your face we're going to we're going to challenge you uh, here on on having vacant properties that you're not putting pe housing people within um, that are not serving as housing and at the end of that period of resistance when there was a need for um, a conclusion you know um, there were community land trusts that were available there that could actually service as um, as 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 places to take on that that housing and then you know be able to to build sort of build the infrastructure of sort of permanent affordability and the challenge you know that I I'm I'm, I'm you know that that exists here in Chicago right um, is that that infrastructure does not exist there is there is a Chicago community land trust which has never functioned as a community land trust right you know there is no community in that land trust um it is the it is at the the behest of the mayor um whomever that is at any given point um and then in terms of the other sort of land trust in, in, in the, there, there are no other sort of land trusts that are serving neighborhoods here um and so um, even as as people are frustrated with this notion that affordable housing could go up for sale and there could be no um no one who was there to kind of serve the purpose of permanent affordability um there's a need to figure out how to develop the, the new infrastructure that's going to be necessary to take on a task like taking on that affordable housing, developing it, you know, actually getting it ready because some of that housing, you know, basically had just been let, left to rot um, with people in them. You know, I mean, this this is what what sort of, you know, private real estate markets are doing. Um, uh, but we, 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 we there's a desperate need for sort of infrastructure that can actually serve that purpose. Um, to that end, and this is not necessarily, you know, um, me pretending that like I actually have a solution um, to that that situation. But this is just me actually saying that, you know, um, this is sort of one thing that needs to happen, right? Um, there's a on, online. Um, I've launched the social media group uh, Chicago Mutual Housing Network. You know, really inspired by um, POC Sustainable Housing Network um, in East Bay, um, NYC Cooperative Housing Exchange, and just some conversations that I've had with um, some of the the, the local you know co housing cooperators here in the city. And you know what um, what what is needed is sort of there's there's some need for some intersection and some conversation between the folks who are living in housing cooperatives but there's also really a need for people to uh, more deeply understand what the possibilities are for um for cooperative housing 
uh, who may not already be in cooperative housing, right? Um, because certainly if you had a greater demand for people to have cooperative housing, you could kind of get some of these zoning restrictions lifted that, you know, are talking about how many people who are unrelated can stay in a house. Um, you can start, uh, you know, talking about where's the funding and the financing from the city to actually um, develop out these units. Um, so to that end, there are a few, a few folks from some of the housing cooperatives in the city that have already kind of dropped in. Um, uh, Mark Smith Foss from uh, Logan Square Cooperative. And um, you know, right now there's a, a conversation around uh, with the Chicago Community Loan Fund around the, um, the hosting of a cooperative town hall uh, because certainly Co Chicago Community Loan Fund has been a, a very big funder of, of a lot of uh, housing cooperatives that are in existence in the city. Um, and, and Chicago Mutual Housing Network is a namesake, um, so there are folks who are in the cooperative space who knew Charlie Dawes. I did not know um, Charlie Dawes, uh, but uh, that was someone who provided deep technical assistance um, to you know a, a lot of the housing cooperatives that um, have formed over the years, and most recently to the Pilsen Housing Cooperative, um, which is the, the most recently formed. Um, initiative. So, you know, I would encourage folks to really dig in, um, you know, check out the Chicago Mutual Housing Network uh, group on Facebook. Um, right now, there's just sort of informational missives out there about what the cooperatives are in the city and about some of the, the issues and the challenges that they are currently facing. Um, but if you're curious, you know, post questions. Um, there are folks in there who might be able to answer those questions certainly better than I can. Um, and so, you know, um, that, that's, that's what that group is there for as a resource. Um, so I encourage folks to to really dig into that. Um, and then finally, I encourage you to reflect on uh, this poster from, um, this was from um, Allied Media Conference. Um, so Allied Media hosted a facilitation meetup um, at the beginning of the, the conference, uh, a, a facilitation network gathering. And so uh, for those folks, you know, who are, you know, not facilitators who have been, who have participated in spaces that have been facilitated, um, just reflect on what it means to be a facilitator, what it means to facilitate for liberation, what it means to coordinate for liberation. Um, you know, one of the things that I've been uh, telling folks over these, uh, uh, over the, the past couple of months has really just been that my eyes are really being open to the possibilities of, of facilitation as the as an essential democratic uh, tool um, you know we need more facilitators we need more folks who really value the importance of facilitation and we need more folks in the room who are aware of the importance of facilitation because that actually helps anyone because no there's there's no facilitator who's actually facilitating alone we are always in concert with the people that we are in the room with we are always in concert with the conversation that's happening in the space and so, you know, this, this reflection and this poster that's coming out from Allied Media Conference is really just helping me to, to, to more deeply root within that space. So, you know, I encourage you to, um, to, to really uh, dig further into um, that facilitation um, network gathering uh, image. Um, I, I think it's been shared on the, um, on the Aorta uh, uh, Facebook page, but, you know, I'll try to circulate it on the, the Colonet Collaborative page just so folks can... Uh, gather it there. Um, so yes, I, I'd encourage you to just take a glance at that. Um, and all of that stated, um, we are, are ready to to make a pivot, make a transition. Um, so tonight um, we've got our, our guest uh, this evening. Um, we're going to be talking to Eric Jackson of the Black Yield Institute. Um, Black Yield Institute is a Baltimore-based Pan-African power institution, um, you know, a think tank, collective action network, um, addressing food apartheid collaboratively with black people and institutions in pursuit of black land and food sovereignty, you know. Um, and so when I hear all of those terms, when I hear all of that, the, the, those, those, uh, the, the, that language, um, I get excited, right? I go back, you know, uh, to my Black Oak Center for Sustainable Renewable Living Days and, and Healthy Food Hub, because uh, land and food sovereignty is where, where this sort of, all of this cooperative and solidarity economy work began for me. And so I'm, I'm definitely very excited to uh, uh, speak with uh, the good brother this evening. And so now I'm going to introduce you and open up the floor. Um, thank you for being on the, on the call with us tonight, Eric. Uh, give thanks. I appreciate the invitation. I'm looking forward to vibing out, man. Talking more about that good stuff. <laughs> yes, yes. 
Um, so, you know, I, I like to, to open the floor um, uh, always with a, a question of a runway, right? Um, so we are here now um, at the Black Yield Institute, um, Pan-African Power Institution, Think Tank Collection Act, Collective Action Network. Um, what's the runway that brings you up to the point that Black Yield Institute is something that you decide to co-found or to launch? Or? Sure. Um, so I always start this story with um, one, uh, paying homage to my grandmother, but also because it's a central part of my story. Uh, my grandmother um, is not the only, you know, uh, um, supporter, uh, rearer, if you will, in my life, but she's one who's central to this story. Um, she raised her children in uh, in the projects in South Baltimore and Cherry Hill, uh, a uh, historically black community. Um, and uh, I, I say all that because that's important to really my development. But it was in her, you know, even before moving to Baltimore, she grew up in outside of Baltimore, Baltimore County, um, to a, a sharecropping family um, where she learned essentially the skills of um waiting on on white folks on white families uh being a, a a day laborer essentially that's how she made her money to feed her children in addition to um the uh um you know welfare you know social welfare uh all of the programs that made it possible for my mother and her siblings to eat um but it was it was through those experiences and growing up in the community of cherry hill that she raised her children to be extremely um committed to place and committed to being black people even if it was not spoken in those terms um but also uh about being proud of who you are and where you're from and so i was uh privileged to grow up poor <laughs> and privileged to grow up in that context because it gave me kind of that understanding, plus the place where I grew up in Cherry Hill, a place that uh, if you were if you were in Baltimore, uh, you would probably be like, well, why are you talking about Cherry Hill like that? Uh, and it's because it's very much uh, an insulated community on the other side of the river um, that was essentially meant for, um, I believe the continued degradation and dehumanizing of black people but just like african peoples have done forever uh we take something that was meant not for our uh our dismay and turn it into something that's amazing and so growing up in that context i'm privileged i'm learning all this stuff i love where i'm from uh, i love being black all these things are great and at 14 my grandmother passed uh she was 69 years old interestingly enough the life expectancy in the community cherry hill today is 69.1 years right so she lived up to what the statistician said she was going to do uh, because of the environment and so that I, that left uh, an emotional stain on me and so as i uh, went off to college and was learning some things um, what became an emotional stain was, uh, I believe, formed as uh, a um, a symbol or a fixture of my politicization. Um, it became clear to me that uh, even at that time, I didn't realize that I was certainly, um, I guess, hyper aware of health of aging and of disease. My grandmother wasn't, she's a central figure to the story, but she's not the only one. Uh, my mother who is still around, uh, I grew up with her with uh, different illnesses, diabetes and, and heart disease to name a few. My father who since passed on, who had issues and almost all of my uh, paternal um, and maternal grandparents passed on some, from some diet related issue. And so I'm becoming super conscious of that. I'm learning about what's going on uh, in the industrial food system. And my world is turned upside down at about 20 or 21. And I'm like, whoa, all of this food, all of this disease stuff is connected to food. It's connected to race. And it's about these power imbalances. I have to make a personal choice, but also uh, because it's a systemic issue, we have to do some things about it. And so um, I knew at that point that I was committed to this work. I went on to get further education, 
further experience as an organizer and realized that working at a public institution like the Baltimore City Health Department had a ceiling. There wasn't, uh, there was a certain point that I was gonna be uh, able to, uh, um, to, to go in terms of organizing tactics, in terms of politics, in terms of political education. And so it was through that ceiling and through, uh, I think a series of an amazing opportunities to meet folks around the country and build a network here in Baltimore that I was like, you know what, not only do I need to leave this place, but this budding uh, food movement in Baltimore is too white. It is too so-called professional and we got to do something about it. And so we started these conversations and house meetings for a few years, just trying to figure out what we were going to do and what our role was to centralize ourselves and uh, figure out how to make sure that uh, black people are fed well, that we have good food, and that um, and that we are at the helm of this work. And uh, that was essentially the the road, if you will, the the uh, the on ramp, uh, the runway to this point of starting what is called today Black Young Institute. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, you're dealing in program areas of urban agriculture, food co-op development, political education, knowledge creation and research, action network building. Um, how did you all settle on those as being sort of the five areas of action that you all wanted to take or the five areas of programming that you all wanted to address? Um, that's a very good question. Well, deep in our ethos at Black Yield Institute is radical accountability. A bunch of what uh, have come out of um, or what have become our five initiative areas came out of direct community conversations that were specifically around uh, what do we need to do to um, increase food availability and do it in a way that honors us as, as a community and as a people. And in particular, this is in Cherry Hill. So our um, food co-op development work and our uh, urban agriculture work came literally out of these community conversations where people said we want these two things plus what i uh coded as um intergenerational cooking so we those particular pathways literally was what community said and then we we dug a little deeper with some deeper listening so we had these conversations and after these conversations, especially in the case of food uh, co-op development, it was like, look, we want a grocery store, but do we want this to be a traditional grocery store or what we like this to be cooperatively owned? And so we did some uh, some political education. We did some uh, some door knocking and we found out essentially that folks wanted to move in this direction. And so 2018, we've been since 2018, we've been working on that. And uh, and same thing with urban ag. There was a farm there in the community that um, uh, had lost a little capacity once the matriarch of the farm passed on. Um, and so we were asked to do it. And so we took on that mantle. And then the other areas were really around um, these noticeable gaps in what was this budding uh, not just the budding food movement at large, but particularly this surgence of black people affirming our blackness and decentralizing whiteness and white institutions at the helm of this work. And so research was important because um, the only folks to this day that are doing research and telling the stories of uh, black and brown people on the ground are private institutions and public agencies. Uh, that's a problem. Right, you have other people telling our stories, researching us, and 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 giving their analysis, and we're sitting back using their data to tell our story. Right, that's a problem. Uh, and then the other areas, again, thinking about political education, you can't have movement without an action network, without coordination, and you can't have it without collective consciousness. And so, those uh, just through relationships and and building relationships on the ground, it was clear that those were some ways that uh, we could contribute to movement work. Absolutely. And um, in terms of the ways that you, well, so, you know, I, I know that um, we had this initial uh, meeting within the Healthy Food Hub um, where we were visioning and where, you know, we, we, we were doing sort of this broad landscape. And then some of that political education is happening there. Um, you know, 
I'm going to veer off for a moment and just ask about what's the continuing political education look like uh, for either, you know, the core team that you're working with or the larger community um, as work sort of picks up pace and as like, you know, you have other projects that you're juggling? Yeah, that's a, that's actually a really good question. Actually, nobody's ever asked me that question. Um, and I got an answer for you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so in terms of the, the core team, so again, deeply embedded in the ethos is continued political education. There is, uh, as Baba Fred Hampton talked about, uh, we've run the risk essentially of creating um, what he considered neo-colonialists uh, if we don't do political education, right? We got people who are ready to, to, to uh, burn down Babylon, but will continue its practices is essentially how I take it. And so we are very clear that that's, uh, it's, it's essential to what we do. So as a team, uh, we have a small team of uh, seven, including myself. Um, at every staff meeting, which is every two weeks, there is a segment etched out for us to do political education of some sort. Or, I mean, whether we're talking about some historic event uh, or we are uh, infusing um, a reading of something um, or, you know, sharing some concept uh, that um, that we should be, you know, grappling with as the work continues. Um, and so that's how we etch, etch it out. And then if I'm honest with you, there are these impromptu moments where I might Personally, I might be inspired by something and I'm given an audience of two or three folks and, and we just sitting down talking about the difference between uh, political theory and political action and how those things, you know, either there are synergies and sometimes some different things and bringing up uh, African independence movement in the 1950s and 60s and how the difference between how what people thought and what they needed to actually liberate and sustain liberation all the way to understanding the uh, the depths of maroon societies and their the utility of the tactics uh, that were used during those times to liberate and liber re liberate African indigenous and white ind indentured servants. That's just to name a few. But in terms of the larger community, um, uh, we again wrap that into what we do. We have an official initiative area where we are uh, currently piloting a 15 week course and we'll be hopefully, um, uh, you know, continuing to add courses as we continue to develop. Uh, not hopefully, we will be adding courses as we develop skill based courses. Uh, our flagship course that uh, we're piloting actually, um, we will make it public in January of 2021. Um, but it is a black land and food sovereignty praxis course that essentially infuses some, uh, I won't say theory, but thinking about, um, thinking about movements, learning about movements, understanding power and oppression and how it shows up in terms of land and food, but then also developing some tactical organizing skills. Um, and so that's what we'll do with that particular course. Um, but then we also wrap political education into, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, that for those who are listening, part of this is political education, right? We might be asked to come and talk on a platform or share in a classroom. We add that as well. Um, but we also include that on our farm, right? And while we are uh, having people come out to so-called volunteer, we're also talking about different current events and or um, you know, grappling with concepts and operational definitions of ideas of food sovereignty and, and black land and food sovereignty. What does that look like? Understanding our own power and privilege and thinking about the pragmatic uh, uh, or pragmatism and, um, and sovereignty, right? What does it actually look like to be in control? So it is, as far as we're concerned, we're looking to stretch the idea of political education in so much that it can happen when we're playing a, a, a game of uh, spades, right? So that wherever the people are, we're engaging in palatable uh, exchange of ideas that help to sharpen uh, our analysis, build relationships, and help us continue our work. So that's kind of how I understand the work. And so that means that it can happen anywhere. Any, anywhere that people are ready to uh, engage, it's, it's, uh, it's time. Absolutely. Um, so the broadcast um, initially began in the pilot space um, in 2018 with uh, four mm -hmm. concepts that we were interviewing and asking guests about. Um, 
it was cooperation, um, capital, economy, autonomy. Um, and, and really, you know, those were just like, I, I feel like those were maybe just four randomly chosen concepts, you know, just cooperation, <laughs> thinking about like, you know, the sort of basic, you know, connecting glue of societies coming together for mutual interest, um, you know, capital, you know, being, you know, all, all the sort of resources and things that, that folks, you know, draw upon, um, sort of economy and the things that are connecting people to place and, and, and one another, um, and then autonomy, you know, um, which ultimately is just, you know, I think what communities are trying to achieve. So I'm, I'm, I'm mentioning those to maybe connect with, um, you say land and food sovereignty, uh, maybe draw a map for us around what sovereignty is meaning there and then, you know, connecting that to land and food and that, that definition. Yeah, so I think, you know, for the listening audience, um, please don't get caught up in the jargon. Sovereignty just means control, right? And for us, uh, making the distinction between concept and operations, control for me operationally looks two ways. It looks like being able to make decisions around uh, the availability of culturally appropriate, affordable and healthy foods in our, in our communities and where we are and where we, uh, where we are expressing our humanity, wherever that is, where we live, worship, play. But it also uh, speaks to the usage of land in those very spaces as well. And so control looks like making decisions, but it also looks like being able to produce for yourself within those contexts, right? And so the reason why uh, I expand it that way, and that's my understanding is because again, thinking about pragmatism, what is possible, and not just what is possible within confines, but I'm talking about even in terms of our imagination, as we are moving toward the world that we want to see, um, we have to be uh, clear that there is a transitional period right and so control can't just look like tomorrow we're gonna get all the land we need to feed all the black folks in baltimore city i did a, a quick mathematical uh analysis based on uh, you know uh just some data that i had is it was uh somewhere between 0.5 and 1.5 um, uh, acres of land to feed one average human being uh and so I was like, let me split the difference. It's an acre, right? It's about, uh, I can't remember the numbers right now, but I think it's about 175, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. 300 and something thousand, uh, 300 and, uh, I don't know, 390 something thousand uh, black people in Baltimore City. That means that we need 390 something thousand acres to feed everybody. That's not gonna happen tomorrow. So sovereignty has to look, like uh, something that is actually real. Otherwise, as Dr. King kind of uh, gave that cautionary tale, um, I'm not about to uh, walk nobody into a burning building, not because of integration uh, or from that context, but I don't want nobody to think that sovereignty looks like, yeah, we're gonna control all of our food by 2050. Well, we gotta we gotta start planning in a different way and capital has to be a part of that that conversation and growing in our backyards and you know uh building the fertility of soil. But anyway, I really digressed my bad. Um <laughs> but when we talk about sovereignty, right, and we're building in these concepts of food and land, we're talking about again being able to be in control um, and not in a lustful sense, but being in control of what is uh, available for ourselves, for our families, for our people um, in so much, and this is the vision that, that I proselytize, um, in so much that we're connected to the ancestors that we come from, in the sense that we're not defining food by what Frito-Lay told us is food. Right. Or uh, any other company, I ain't even trying to give them no marketing or uh, any any privileges, but any company would say is food. But being able to define what is our food and uh, engage in our own food cultures, that's what sovereignty looks like. Right. Being able to um, being able to uh, get clear, at least for ourselves, um, how we are being the best stewards are on land as land-based people and what foods are available to us and what foods we can make available to us so that we are benefiting economically, socially, politically, 
uh, and culturally from the production, distribution, uh, and consumption of the types of foods that we either decided and or produced for ourselves. So th that is for me, if I had to give a nutshell what sovereignty is, it is being able to decide for yourself, just like the so-called American dream has has uh, has been afforded or at least um, uh, shared that we're supposed to be able to make decisions for ourselves. Uh, black folks are not uh, afforded the opportunity to do so. And so we're talking about a movement that humanizes us by connecting us and reconnecting us with the very uh, physical ecosystems, social ecosystems that we come from and that allows us the opportunity to be fully human. That's, that's what sovereignty looks like. And that's what all of the work that we talked about those five initiative areas are um are designed to do and any project that comes out of that it's about connecting people to ourselves connecting us to our histories and the contemporary context connecting us and being better stewards of the world um and uh essentially um being able to like i said be uh be fully human in the ways that we decide not the way that white institutions have said that we need to be um but in in very uh real ways being able to uh engage in the world collectively and independently in ways that make sense for us absolutely yeah um you know at, at the healthy food hub we used to pause um and you know and 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 at the in the middle of the hub you know one we always used to say our mission statement at the hub uh, but you know our, our mission is to build a just holistic local food system to transform urban to rural communities through education entrepreneurship and access to healthy affordable food burned in my brain mm -hmm. you know i mean over 10 years i can't let it go um <laughs> but you know the other thing we always used to say was you know own the pipeline you know production aggregation distribution you know we want to own the pipeline you know um because ultimately that that's what gives you know that that's the democratic food system that we're seeking you know it's not you know sure. 700 choices at the point of consumption it's all the way sure. along the, the line you know so yeah. um so so then you know I'm, and I'm hearing here, you know, another thing that we always talked about was just, you know, that food is that that the market was um, that it, we were a market organized around food, but we were not really about food. So, um, you know, I mean, maybe talk as uh, talk about, you know, you've talked a little bit about food as sort of a, a gateway and a pathway to, you know, this Absolutely. other world and this other vision Absolutely. and this other imagination. So I'm, I'm just Absolutely. giving you some room to go there. What's this? What's the food, the gateway that you that you're you're angling towards? the liberation of African peoples. That is ultimately what it is. But my, so again, I, I uh, talked earlier, you see me moving, right? You're getting the juices flowing out now. Um, so I, I have uh, actually, we just recorded today, um, one of the uh, brothers that I work with, one of my colleagues, Brother Lee, and I do a uh, talk show. Ever since uh, COVID, we've been doing kind of like this uh, precursor to a podcast that we will release in 2021. Um, and in that recording today, we were talking about maroons and food and land, right? And so uh, thinking about maroonage and what that meant in a uh, 16th, 17th, 18th and 19th uh, and I guess depending on where you're talking about 20th centuries um, you, you you're talking about uh, food food was a pathway to maintain the liberation of these societies throughout the African world right throughout the African diaspora so you're talking about food as um, as a political tool, right? And by political, I'm talking about a power tool to feed the people, to uh, heal the people, to sustain health for the people, um, and as a means of trade and economic power, as well as as a as a tool as a weapon, essentially, right? I'm I'm reminded of the story that I learned about Queen Nanny of the Maroons in uh, in the I believe it's the Blue Mountains um in jamaica uh who use um herbs to um to ward off and in many cases not only uh dismember like not dismember but to to chill out but also kill 
um, the approaching uh, Englishmen and people who were trying to uh, push against what they, what their mission was, and that was the re-liberation of themselves, right? And so I've, I've only mentioned that to say that uh, food is just that, right? And, and also, let me back up. When folks were attempting to break up these maroon societies, one of the first things that they would do were to get to the, the communal and or independent gardens that were in the maroon societies because they knew that if you destroy the people's food, then you destroy their ability to sustain themselves and to create everything outside of that. If we can't feed ourselves, we can. We, the the conversation about liberation, the conversation about equity, the conversation about uh, freedom, whatever we want to call it, those conversations are null and void. And in fact, they are rhetorical, right? They're not anything that we're going to be able to build on and build action around. And so, again, we're talking about uh, a vehicle to. Um, you talked earlier on, uh, Brother Mike, about the, the uh, um, uh, you, what did you say earlier? I, and I liked how you put it. It was really good, too. Um, it's not coming to me right now, but, um, but essentially us attempting to um, figure out ways to be human, you know, to be fully ourselves. And... Um, you, you can't do that. You can't do that without feeding yourself. That's what you were talking about, nationhood. You were talking about nationhood and you're talking about, uh, you know, building democratic, uh, you know, communities. You can't do that if you don't have mechanisms and apparatus uh, for, for feeding ourselves. And then also really being able to have a be in right relationship with the land. You know, as people are saying, which I think is right, um, Whoever made the land, whether you say it's from uh, a creator or creators or from the Big Bang, ain't nobody making no more land, right? We can we can be sure about that. Um, now we can try to we can do as much as we can through alchemy to fix the land and and change the land and heal the land. But this relationship to the land itself, whether that's land on you know uh, the the earth or land underneath the water. We have to be in right relationship with that land. I, I can make the argument all day long about um, about stewardship and and all of that, but ultimately, you're talking about these connections with these these beings that we are connected to at another level that the you know that the listening audience may not feel. But the thing is, we gotta be able to be connected to those things in the same way we're connected to our histories because that's where we draw inspiration from. Right, there is no liberation without motivation, inspiration, and a dang on sure is no liberation without food. And so we need to be able to figure out all the things that we need to feed ourselves. Otherwise, a conversation about uh, freedom, liberation, equity, and all of that uh, makes absolutely no sense to have. Hmm. Yeah, you know, yeah, um, your your the the discussion around uh, land um, is reminding me of. Um, I want to say this was, I think this was on the 1619 podcast. I'm, I'm not sure, but um, if not, it was one of the many articles I was reading, you know, but effectively um, there was um, someone who was, who was going back and visiting some of their family um, in the South and um, one of the elders, you know, they were talking about one of the elders who was like 96 years old um, and they were talking about, they were describing um, how he would get on the tractor and how he would dismount from the tractor while it was moving. Like, you know, I mean, he's like hopping off of this tractor like, you know, he's a teenager. Um, yeah. and, and, and effectively, their family had held on to the land, you know, um, uh, post, post the enslavement period, right? Um, you, know, uh, um, you know, emancipation, as it were. Um, and so this, this you know, uh, this, this particular, you know, elder had known, you know, had known the ability to live on his family's land for the entirety of his life. And, you know, what does that actually do? What What is that in the body space? Like, you know, I mean, how, do, how does liberation become embodied when, you know, you, 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 you ain't never known sure. having to like, you know, shuffle, you know, for nobody to, to make no rent money. You know, this is our yep. land, you know, and this is all yep. we've known. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, I mean, and that's what we're talking about, developing new ways of being. 
right? And, and new ways of becoming. You can't do that if you are ultimately confined by other people's rules and laws and norms uh, that essentially shape how you think, speak, and uh, engage and interact. Um, that That is what we're talking about being able to, if you can control um, land, and, and notice I didn't say own, but if you can control land in such a way that you can practice yourself fully, then you're talking about being able to, um, being able to essentially create a reality that that uh, nobody can, you know, nobody can tell you what to do. You know what I'm saying? Um, and I don't mean that in the in the individualistic sense that like, can't nobody tell me what to do. I got the right to do. No, I ain't talking about that. I'm talking about being able to decide um, how and what you want to be at any given point. Um, that 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 is what control uh, affords you the ability to be full. Right. And and so I think, you know, in 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 celebrating that elder, you know, uh, I imagine never feeling like you have to have the stress, like you said, of shucking and driving for somebody else when you always know that you got it. And so when I think about being on land and thinking about producing our own food, we also are talking about raising and rearing next generation children that don't have to do that, right? Or know the importance of being able to produce your own food, whether it's in a small family garden for uh, sustenance um, or, uh, or being able to, you know, produce to be, uh, to share with your neighbors or to commercially sell it, right? Either way, you're talking about leaning on these ancient practices that we have been uh, uh, precluded from following because of um, either physical and other uh, impediments or through some socialization process that's not our own. It's foreign, right? Um, I, I think about it, uh, somebody commented about putting choice back in our body. That's the, that's the other thing, too. You think about the psychological impacts of other people controlling our food environments. And I talk about this often of one of the impacts of food apartheid, the immaterial stuff. We're, we're, it's easy to talk about not having a grocery store, uh, 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 carryouts, inundation of, of unhealthy foods. All of those things are easy to point to. Um, and even with that, we peel back and think about, you know, uh, potholes and all the other stuff that you may not think about that that also comes with food apartheid. But then also uh, thinking about immaterial things like the uh, premature death of elders. And in our traditions, elders are the culture keepers and the culture givers, the story sharers. If they pass prematurely, who's telling the stories? Is it the Kardashians? Right. Is it is it is it and I don't mean to give them no promotion, uh, but it, is it who who's telling the stories what there are people, as Dr. Marimba and he talks about uh, culture is the uh, immune system of a people. If we don't have that immune system, it breaks down. Right. You will be destroyed without an immune system. You can't fight off anything. So we're going to get culture from somewhere. And, and in many ways, we are uh, not able to follow that which we come from because our culture givers are gone or we have developed uh, cognition that um, we don't have to listen to them, the elders, right? But on the other side of that, man, what you also see is, um, uh, I was going somewhere, oh my goodness, it's late, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> Choice in the body, um, liberated body, land. Yeah, you know. yeah, that's what it was. Thank you, thank you. Um, thinking about psychology, right? When I was growing up, the physiological response of hunger, I immediately thought about getting food, and which all people do. But if you're not able to embody choice within your body or being able to uh, embody sovereignty, what you're relegated to, if, if you grew up in a context like me, I grew up in the Cherry Hill community that I uh, dis, um, described earlier. I thought about going to the refrigerator and largely in the refrigerator were foods that were either prepared or stuff you can pop in the, uh, in the oven um, that my mother worked her tail off to make sure we had that we got from a grocery store. Or it meant uh, going to call somebody and ordering food again taking away your uh, choice and somebody else feeding you 
or going to the shopping center uh, and going to purchase some food from someone who's not from our community that is extracting wealth. So, and I'm not talking about this, uh, you know, um, I'm not speaking as if we're talking about anything pure because I just ordered food earlier. It was Ethiopian food, granted, but still, you know, it's black, you know, supporting a black business. But what I guess what I'm saying is we think about uh, the, the, the deeper impacts and implications on uh, not being able to control our food environments. And so that's codified through social policy, essentially, where people are um, perpetuating that over time. And then you have generations of people who never think about cooking a meal. You know, cooking looks like microwaving. Right. Or uh, generations of people who don't see it as a problem that we're spending uh, 30 percent of our food dollars uh, in our community, but not with our community, with our people. It doesn't dawn on us. Right. So a part of our work is about denormalizing food apartheid in so much that we peel it back and people understand, like, oh, this is what we are. We this is what we're trying to kind of entrapped in, and this is the economic and and psychological and other impacts of not being in control of our own destinies. Denormalizing food apartheid. Um, you know that that's that's uh, that's a heavy punctuation mark. Um, and you know I want to. So there, there are two sort of directions that I want to go. One, you know, I just want to give you an opportunity to, you, you've talked about denormalizing food apartheid. Um, Black Yield Institute produced the documentary, Baltimore Strange Fruit. Um, did you want to just kind of uh, give people a, a snapshot of that, a snippet of what that work was about um, and how it relates to that that concept of denormalizing food apartheid? For sure. Um, so the central story within the film Baltimore Strange Fruit is the story of my grandmother that I kind of talked a little bit about at the beginning of the program. And um, the story um, did, I think, a good job of humanizing the story, right? Of uh, allowing people to see like, oh, this is how it impacts people in so much that people literally would come afterward and, and, and say, you know, no matter what you know, race, color, or creed, or whatever, uh, people would say, my grandmother had a similar story, right? And so that was that was the centralizing character and centralizing narrative. But then we also uh, sought with the film to break down these ideas of, uh, of, of normalizing language like food deserts and really lifting up what we're really talking about because we believe that food deserts are, you know, really speak to uh geographical location and speak to and ha and really heavy in its analysis uh when there is one on the presence of a grocery store which is also an extractive uh institution in communities and so we say that food apartheid is is a, in the film we assert that food apartheid is a little more telling because it speaks to conditions there is a uh, built into the analysis is, is anti-imperialist um, anti-capitalist uh, approach and one that lifts up the conditions, the political and intentional conditions that have happened and been codified over time that have created not only the lack of uh, uh, healthy, affordable, and culturally appropriate food, but ultimately results in um, the premature deaths and disease of our people. And so um, the film just, I think, does a, a good job of uh, talking about place um, and specifically uh, centralizing Baltimore, but also telling a larger story of African peoples and what um, food apartheid looked like at the point at which uh, our people were um, taken and uh, traded as commodities and forced into uh, to free labor during uh, periods of enslavement and post enslavement as well. We say that food apartheid started back then when our when our uh, choice when we were dehumanized and our choice was taken away from us and our skills were um, we were forced to utilize our skills and our expertise to build this country without uh, proper compensation. Absolutely. So the film kind of explores those things. And get and and kind of uh, draw people in with some uh, political commentary as well as sharing people's experiences that go beyond Baltimore, but connects people to the place of uh, of Baltimore. Mm -hmm. 
And so there, there uh, were a couple of, you know, um, elements that, you know, I've been drawing from um, from throughout the interview and then, you know, a few that you've mentioned here. Um, so, you know, uh, this this broadcast is sort of um, broadly about this notion of Ujima, you know, um, both uh, in the sense that, you know, um, folks kind of recited during Kwanzaa as cooperative economics. Um, in the sort of true Swahili sense, you know, in the, in the Yere sense of uh, familyhood. Um, but, you know, really just a, about what it would look like to create um, the sort of economy that is, is, is life-sustaining, that is restorative. Um, you've, you've, had, you've said some values around um, self-determination. You've, you, you uh, said some pieces around non-extraction. Um, what's, so, what's your vision of what an economy would look like that is uh, serving the values that your work is speaking towards. Mm. Can I? Uh, is it actually possible at this time to um, to share something? Uh, uh, yeah. Is I, that? So, or so like share is, the screen? Um, I have not tried that with this particular tool. <laughs> so. Can um, we try it? Are you opposed to it? I'm not opposed to it. You know, yeah. If it, if it has a share button on your side, you can try it, and you know, we'll we'll see what happens. I don't think anything will break. All right, and if it doesn't, I will verbally speak to it, but it'll be very quick. Let me just okay. um, let me see. Uh, yeah, let's let me uh. Can you, can you see this? Uh, let's see. Okay. Yeah, they have. Uh, they they got the cam for you. Sure enough. Oh, uh, cool. So you so you can see this uh, this mural. Absolutely. Okay. So this is you know when we kind of first got started, uh, um, we had this piece. Well, not when we first got started, but we got this piece con uh, commissioned, um, and this is essentially a vision of Black land and food sovereignty. It doesn't you know if there nobody necessarily. Uh, says that this is how it needs to go. But ultimately what this uh, depiction is, of, um, or what this, this uh, piece of art is, is a depiction of several community institutions where people are essentially aligning with one another and protecting a space that essentially they govern and control. People can understand this piece as, you know, happening in, on one particular land parcel or land mass, or happening throughout, but these different concepts and thoughts of uh, an economy where the people essentially like built into the economy, you have these, uh, you know, not just, as you can see here, um, there are major, you know, kind of uh, uh, symbols of food or what have you, but then some other things like you know, cultures and religious institutions or a, a religious institution, um, you know, this herbal clinic, but essentially all of the, all of these institutions that we would need essentially to, uh, to make all of these pieces run and considering what you talked about, you know, familyhood and uh, Ujima um, as a, as a principle being weaved throughout the whole thing. And, um, and the last theme that may not necessarily pop out at you, but at the top of this uh, painting, what you see are the people holding hands. And I don't want people to misunderstand this as some kind of kumbaya. This literally is about protection, right? About building a wall that's based on the people, uh, protecting uh, those uh, from, from being you know, exploited from outside forces. Um, but then you also might see in this picture some uh, some mamas standing by Fannie, Fannie Lou Hamer food co-op uh, uh, stacked with the AKs too. So um, the economy essentially looking like these um, looking like these uh, systems and these institutions working together to essentially sustain life for the people. That's that's what it would look like to me. Um, 
just as colorful uh, with all of these elements. And in fact, uh, if, if you might note at the top, uh, you have the food co-op, then you have this river uh, or this waterway that's that's uh, through the land and these uh, hoop houses that are indicative of a farm. Um, those are three aspects of this economy that we are working out uh, as we speak uh, in, in the Cherry Hill community um, and in, uh, in Baltimore. So that's, that's, you know, where we are. And that's what we're looking to, you know, amplify or at least create a quarter um, in South Baltimore that uh, resembles at some level, uh, those things. So expanding our farm and producing more food and lifting up a nursery, uh, as well as uh, this food co-op, this uh, cooperative grocery store, and potentially, fingers crossed, y'all pray for us, an aquaculture project um, that also cleans the water for recreational fishing and other, other things, but that also uh, provides an opportunity for us to uh, potentially erect an oyster farm as well. I say all of that to say that, that this is what we're hoping to do, to build you know, uh, aspects of this economy that align with other anchor institutions and align with other uh, efforts that are happening in the community, particularly in the Cherry Hill community, that is undergoing uh, redevelopment as we speak, uh, redevelopment that is induced by the people at some level, um, and, and that elders you know, have been working on for 20 years, things that are finally happening. Um, it looks like an economy where essentially we control what happens within it and that they're working uh, together. So that's that. I hope that that uh, that visual uh, paints a better picture than I could, you know, speak to anything. <laughs> um, yes, I, I think that was uh, deeply illust Ill illustrative, and um, you know, and certainly, uh, and we got an opportunity to test some features of this tool that I didn't know was showing up. So that was fantastic, you know. Um, yeah. So uh, so one thing I want to do is just make sure that folks know. Um, uh, www.blackyieldinstitute.org. Um, that's the website, uh, Black Yield Institute. So make sure that you check that out. Um, www.blackyieldinstitute.org. Um, I will make sure that I drop that in the comments where you all have access to it. Um, and and while I'm I'm fetching that up, um, are there what what are the supports that are needed? What are what are ways that folks you know if, if folks want to support, if folks want to plug in? Um, what does Black Yield Institute need now? Sure. Um, so first, what I would say is I think that um, we talked about the film briefly. Uh, if if folks are interested in joining the work, deep relationship building is the way that you do that. Uh, being around, volunteering at our farm is an easy way of getting registered. Um, and, in, and you can do that by connecting with us through our website. Um, by leaving a message and I'll make sure to get you to the right, you know, staff person so that you can get registered. But if folks, no matter who you are, however you identify racially or otherwise, whatever your politics are, um, what we could, how you could be of support of our, you know, movement building is by learning more about what we do and learning from our perspectives. And you can do that by staying connected and staying tuned. Uh, easy way is to follow us on YouTube, follow us on Instagram to kind of know what's happening, become a part of the work uh, through volunteerism and also through, uh, uh, well, I would say deep volunteerism that we have through a special program that we have called PALS. These are program action leaders, folks that uh, advise and support our initiatives um, at, at on the ground. Um, and so you know those are ways but also folks could you know connect with the film and get a, a different flavor or a better flavor of of kind of how we approach the work and how we see the world um and then also i mean i'm not shy to talk about it you know if folks want to support um please feel free to support us you can uh give a donation of one dollar to a thousand dollars if your pocket's deep like that uh on uh paypal uh, on um, Inst uh, I was about to say Instagram <laughs> on uh, on Venmo and on um, on PayPal on Venmo and on uh, on Cash App if you like uh, if you feel like no I don't want to donate but I will purchase you know some merchandise whether it's a shirt 
uh, a uh, you know the actual the mural that I just shared with people. You can purchase a, either a framed copy of that or an unframed copy of that. Uh, those are ways that you can support. And as a as a pal, as I talked about, you would be able to support any of those five initiative areas. Um, and if folks actually at this particular point are interested in the idea of the co-op, whether you want to help or you're interested in pledging membership, uh, you can also um, get to our landing page for Cherry Hill Food Co-op at uh, www.cherryhillfoodcoop.com, pledge membership. Um, and in general, if you're like, no, nah, money is not the way, merchandise is not the way, uh, the film is not the way, I just want to learn more, shoot us an email through the website um, and uh, let's, let's find a way to connect. If you feel like you have skills to lend to the work, let's get to know each other and we can figure out how we can work together uh, and that way. But yeah, those are, those are ways that folks can stay connected. All right, all right. And uh, yeah, we got a question in the chat about where we can find the film. Um, so on blackyieldinstitute.com, uh, film's there. And I believe, you know, films all, I, I know I purchased the film on Vimeo. So, you know, if, if folks mm -hmm. uh, already have that Vimeo account, um, you can get the digital film there on Vimeo. You can get sort of, you know, on demand, you know, viewing of the film. Um, and are there are, are there folks doing like virtual screenings now? I know that I've seen it, you know, some some of our friends have done virtual screenings of other things. Are folks hitting you up for virtual screenings? Uh, not at this time. Uh, we when the film first came out in 2018, we got a lot of screenings. Uh, things slowed down with COVID, but we're absolutely open to doing a, uh, a screening and uh, a talk, you know, before and or after. Um, absolutely. And if you check out the uh, website you'll it'll connect you there or you can go directly to uh, be more strange uh to find out you know information us in the media all that kind of stuff i want to say thank you brother mike for your purchase uh you know um virtually if you want to get it virtually it's 15 dollars to purchase um if you want it on demand it's uh rent for 24 hours it's five bucks and um, if you would like to get a physical copy, just, you know, hit, hit me up, hit us up through the website and we'll absolutely uh, find a way to uh, either ship it to you uh, if you are, uh, you know, somewhere other than Baltimore. Otherwise, we'll figure it out. But those are the ways in which people can support the work. And, and more than anything, stay tuned. Join our newsletter. Um, you can, you know, email us through the website to let us know that you want to be a part of that mailing list so that you can know about the amazing things coming up. Um, and yeah, I said it, I'm biased. There's amazing stuff coming up. Um, so yeah, please, uh, please stay tuned. Um, and I would just say one last thing, Mike, if I can. Um, we are, uh, every, we're celebrating five years at Black Youth Institute. Um, our uh, every year we do this uh, hall, this fall festival called Fall into BYI. Um, and Fall into BYI this year will be, uh, for the most part, the week from uh, Friday, October 30th to Friday, November 6th, which is the culminating event. Uh, that one will be, we'll have some in-person um uh and some stuff that's that's uh virtual the in person on the 6th will be very limited um however throughout the week we will have social media engagement so follow us on instagram on facebook and uh twitter and for all of those accounts it's uh at black yield or facebook black yield institute um and you'll get all of the engagements then but also uh as i said if you get on our newsletter you'll be able to see some of the exclusive things that are happening uh with our work we are looking to uh expand um our palates and what it looks like to to not only denormalize food apartheid but normalize everyday struggle to resist it and that's what we've aimed our work to do so in those very small ways uh you can see how we are uh, doing that even if you're not local to uh both this is a pan-african work uh doesn't matter where you are where you're listening to this from uh we are producing um what we believe are potential models for us to learn from uh all of us including us the ones that are doing it in the day-to-day -day, we're learning from it and we're figuring out ways for us to uh, continue to utilize um what we're those learnings toward uh liberation excellent excellent 
Um, you know, well, I mean, this this has been you know a sort of a, a Stella Stella time on, on you know on the on the you know interview segment with you. I really appreciate you know you joining us this evening. Um, is there a, a sort of favorite you know last closing thought that maybe you all have closed a meeting with, or you know or you you just kind of punctuate your work with you know that that you'd like to to drop on folks' heads at the moment? Yes, two things. Whoever controls the food controls the people. Keep the flame. <laughs> Any Whoever blessings? controls the food controls the people. Yes, keep the flame. Uh, much obliged, uh, you know, um, Brother Eric. You know, really appreciate uh, you being on the call this evening. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll bid you good night. Thank you, good brother. Uh, and when we have our podcast, I'll make sure uh, that we, we give an invitation. I, I really love this vibe. Even though I won't host it, uh, I'll make sure, man, this was this was really strong. And I appreciate your insights and really uh, am grateful for the opportunity to, uh, to join the amazing platform. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Keep the All flame. Right. Many blessings, bro. Peace. All right. Be well. Peace. All right, folks. Whew. Um, that was that was fire. That was um, that was tonight's Ujima hour. And you know, um, I don't like how my camera's showing here, um, so I'm not gonna worry about it too much. Um, this is cooperation for liberation. Um, so you know, make sure that you you, you tune in. Um, November first is when uh, cooperation for liberation study and working group will be back in session. Um, please make sure that you are subscribed to the mailing list, which I will put into the chat. Um, here um, on groups.io. Um, Cooperation for Liberation Study and Working Group is a space where we are committed to the study of, um, of these models. Um, you know, models such as uh, the one from Black Yield Institute, uh, models such as, uh, you know, uh, Freedom Farms and Fannie Lou Hamer, models such as uh, Young Negro Cooperative League and uh, Ella Baker, um, you know, and, and all of the sort of radical history of, of cooperation that exists in the Black radical tradition. Um, those are the things that we study. Those are the things we dig into, uh, because ultimately we are trying to chart again the future of uh, of of you know black cooperatives um, here here in Chicago. You know um, through the development of a worker cooperative that is a key part of our mission. Um, so we invite you to study with us uh, three to six p.m. Um, we we meet biweekly on Sundays, and the next meeting is November first. Um, check that out. Uh, make sure that you follow the Cola Nut Collaborative on Facebook. Um, so, you know, hopefully that you're, you're seeing the stream through the Cola Nut Collaborative page. If you have not liked the page, like the page. Um, you know, we, we value um, all those likes and we, we value you spreading the information around to folks that you know, um, folks that you are friends with. Um, and um, we look forward to you joining us uh, next month um, when we will be talking with Malikia Johnson of Take Care of Each Other World Tour. Um, so our November segment is going to be Malikia Johnson, um, and Malikia has done actually. A, a, we 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 embarked on a very similar path, right? Um, both of us wanted to study, you know, what people were doing in, in the realm of cooperatives and and in, in building a more cooperative world. Um, Malikia did that through the Take Care of Each Other World Tour. Um, I am doing that on the monthly uh, with, through the Ujima Hour. Um, and then in December, we close out the year with Alita Ture, a Parable of the Sower Intentional Community Cooperative. So uh, we have both been deeply anticipating this segment um, in December uh, because effectively, um, we scheduled, I scheduled most of these segments way back in June. You know, I, I got my calendar, you know, full up through um, around, or actually around May or so. Yeah, in fact, when we took the sort of shelter in place, that's when I, I focused on filling up the, the 2020 calendar. So me and Alita have been just, you know, anxious to kind of uh, sit down and, and do this um, interview. Um, and, and, you know, we've been waiting basically for seven months, you know, to kind of get it lined up. Um, so, yeah, I'm looking forward to the December gathering. I'm looking forward to the November gathering and I'm looking forward to 2021. So if there are folks that have not been have not been on this segment and there are a lot of people who haven't been on this segment, it's it's only about 23 interviews that are that are online. Um, then you, you want to make sure that you just recommend uh, let us know who we should be talking to, um, who we have not talked to. Um, so that we can get this intimate and informal uh, view of the black social solidarity economy in the U.S. and elsewhere. Um, and so 
with that said, uh, it is uh, now 20 minutes past our, our normal 8.30 close, and, you know, I'm going to go get me uh, some um, elderberry cider or something or other, some kombucha, whatever's in this fridge. Um, I appreciate you all for joining me on the Ujima Hour. I appreciate you for staying for the time that you did, and I look forward to seeing you next month um, for, again, you know, Malikia uh, Johnson's uh, segment. Um, again, November 9th. Be here. Um, so we're here uh, second Monday of every month, uh, 7.30 to 8.30ish, um, and we appreciate you for joining us. Uh, this has been the Ujima Hour, and I bid you all good night.